At the previous video chapter we discovered the drifting of holes inside of a p-type semiconductor while connecting the crystal to a DC voltage source. Even in the absence of an electric field, the holes can move through the crystal lattice. The energy level of the covalent bonds between the impurity atom and each of the close by silicon atoms is identical. No energy is needed to push the hole around the impurity atom, hence it doesn't matter where the hole is located. To move the hole away from the impurity atom, an electron has to be transferred from a neighboring silicon atom to the impurity atom. During this procedure, a negatively charged ion, originating from the impurity atom, and a positively charged silicon ion is created. Energy is needed to crack the bond between two silicon atoms and to separate the electron from one of the silicon atoms. There is a gain of energy while the electron is entering the impurity atom and while one more covalent bond is formed between those atom and the fourth silicon atom. The energy difference of the whole process can be extracted from the thermal energy of the atoms, hence the process is running in both directions. There is no difference in the process of electron transfer at all four close by silicon atoms. At high temperatures, room temperature is sufficient, the hole can migrate from the impurity atom. The movement of the hole is irregular and it can also move back to the dopant atom. The random movement of the hole is called diffusion. Let's connect the crystal lattice to a DC voltage source. The positive terminal is at the top of the crystal and the negative terminal at the bottom. As soon as an even small electric field is established, the energy level of the hole differs, depending on its position around the impurity atom. The hole is pushed to the negative terminal at the bottom, the electrons are pulled to the positive terminal at the top. While the field strength is increasing, the process of drifting holes inside of a p-type semiconductor starts. The hole is moving to the negative terminal, the electrons are handed to different silicon atoms while they are moving step by step to the positive terminal. Let's have a look at a n-type semiconductor. The electron is just loosely bond to the donor atom. At room temperature, the electron is removed from the impurity atom and it is moving around randomly inside of the crystal lattice. For a short span of time, the electron can also be located at the impurity atom. If the crystal lattice is connected to a DC voltage source, the electron starts drifting to the positive terminal. Let's disconnect the voltage source and join a p-type and a n-type semiconductor. At the right side you can see a n-type region with a phosphorus atom and at the left side there is a n-type region with an aluminium atom. The discussed diffusion processes occur at both sides of the crystal. In course of the random movement, 
an electron can hit a hole. Electrons are attracted by the positively charged silicon ions next to the holes. The silicon ion is transformed into a neutral atom which can form 4 covalent bonds with the 4 close by silicon atoms. The electron enters the vacant place between the two silicon atoms resulting in an additional covalent bond. This process is called recombination. A negatively charged aluminium ion at the p-type region and a positively charged phosphorus ion inside of the n-type region are left behind. If a mobile electron recombines with a hole, both hole and electron vanish. The charge is located at the immobile impurity atoms now. An electric field is created by the two ions, painted with magenta colored arrows. Inside of the field, a negatively charged particle is pulled to the n-type region at the right side. Vice versa, a positively charged particle is pulled to the p-type region at the left side. The electric field opposes the diffusion process of electrons and holes between the two regions. Let's connect the arrangement to a DC voltage source. The positive terminal is connected to the p-type region at the left side and the negative terminal is connected to the n-type region at the right side. The electric field of the voltage source is running contrarious to those between the two ions. To the left and to the right of the ions, both fields are pointing into the same direction. The electric field between the two ions is weakened. If the voltage output of the power supply increases, the electric field between the ions fades away and the charge carriers can move between the two halves. An electron is extracted at the positive terminal and a hole starts drifting through the crystal lattice. An electron is injected at the negative terminal, which moves to the left according to the direction of the electric field. At the space between the two ions, the hole and the electron recombine and once again the movable charge carrier vanish. During this process, one electron has been transferred from the negative terminal to the positive terminal of the voltage source. Now we will discover the processes running at the reverse polarity. The negative terminal is connected to the p-type region and the positive terminal is connected to the n-type region. Now the electric field between the two ions is enforced by the field of the voltage source. The diffusion or drift of movable charges between the two regions is inhibited by both fields. Electrons are pulled back to the n-type region, holes to the p-type region. Let's put additional impurity atoms to the crystal lattice and observe what happens inside of the electric field. Electrons are removed from the p-type region by the voltage source, hence positive charged ions are left behind. At the left side, electrons are injected and those additional electrons recombine with the holes of the p-type region. As you can see, the result of these processes is the formation of additional immobile ions and the field is getting stronger. The p-type region of the crystal is three times negatively charged, which makes it hard to inject more electrons. The n-type region is three times positively charged, which makes it hard to remove more electrons. 
The flow of electric charges is inhibited by this kind of polarity. A semiconductor device with a single PN junction is called diode. Let's measure the current running through a PN junction in relation to the attached voltage. The silicon diode used here, a P600J, can be operated with a maximum voltage of 420V and a maximum current of 6A. The n-type region is at the left side and it is marked by a thin line running around the device. A small 12V 5W filament lamp is connected in series to the diode. The lamp limits the current running through the circuit, because the diode will be damaged by a too high current. The black clamp is connected to the negative terminal of the voltage source and the red clamp is connected to the positive terminal via the ampermeter and the resistance wire. The yellow and the green clamp are connected to the voltmeter. The 3.3 and 12V output of a power supply of an old computer is used as voltage source. A simple voltage divider is made of a resistance wire. The white clamp can be moved along the wire. With the help of this construction, the diode can be supplied to a voltage between minus 12 and plus 12V. Some chapters later we will learn how to build an adjustable voltage source with the help of semiconductor devices. Two digital multimeter are used as indicators. The left one is connected in series to the diode, indicating the current and the right one is connected in parallel to the device, indicating the attached voltage. Let's start with the reverse polarity. The p-conducting side of the diode is connected to the negative terminal of the voltage source and the n-conducting side is connected to the positive terminal via the ampermeter, the lamp and the resistance wire. As you can see, the diode is connected to a voltage of minus 11.23V, which is the maximum output of the power supply and current of 0.011mA is running through the device. There is a very low current passing the diode, because some electron hole pairs are actively being created near the junction by thermal energy and the relative high electric field inside of the thin depletion layer. While moving the slide in contact along the resistance wire, the negative voltage at the diode and thus the current through the circuit is decreasing. At the point of zero volt, no current can be detected. Now the polarity of the voltage source is altered. The positive terminal of the voltage source is connected to the p-type region of the diode and the n-type region is connected to the negative terminal via the ampermeter, the lamp and the resistance wire. The diode is connected in forward direction. The 3.3V output of the power supply is used. At a voltage output of 0.17V, the ampermeter can't detect a current through the diode. While the voltage output is increased by moving the slide in contact, we can see 
that a current starts running through the circuit. The filament of the lamp is not glowing yet. The electric field of the voltage source is weakening the field of the depletion layer slightly. Around a detected voltage of 0.7V, the current running through the diode increases significantly. Let's switch the digital multimeter to a higher range and connect the resistance wire to the 12V output of the power supply. With increasing forward voltage, the depletion layer becomes thin enough that the zone's electric field can't counteract the charge carrier movement across the PN junction. The resistance of the diode decreases clearly and the lamp starts glowing. While the voltage attached to the diode is increasing, more electrons can drift from the n-type region to the p-type region and more holes can drift from the p-type region to the n-type region. The result of the measurement is the typical current voltage characteristics of a p-n junction diode. That's all about p-n junction for now. You can find some more information at the project page. Thanks for watching.